Now I'd like to welcome Dr. James Lynham, who'll be touching on up and coming treatments, aims of chemo and strategies to man manage dexamethasone, which hopefully will just be a, um, a practical, helpful few tips um, with long and short term side effects. So please put your hands together for James Lynham. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for turning up. Um, several of you will know me. Um, I've been given the brief by, by Sandy and as she mentioned in the introduction, it's impossible to address everyone's individual uh, situation. So I'm actually keeping this really quite broad, um, but I'm happy to address any questions afterwards. Um, and a lot of this you guys will know, but uh, I'm just going through it at a really, relatively basic level, but just in, in, touching on the important points. Um, who am I? I'm a medical oncologist. I'm one of the chemotherapy doctors. I'm probably the last major specialist that most people meet. meet. People usually obviously meet neurosurgeons first and the radiation doctors and then they come and see us. Um, but I'm probably the people, the person, the doctor that most people see for the longest because I keep an eye on people for a very long time with my horrible drugs. Um, so I get to know my patients quite well. Um, excuse my outfit, my uh, nickname around the department is Style Over Substance. So I try and set the bar up here. Um, <laughs> I hope that's because of my style as opposed to the substance. Um, first topic I was going to talk about is steroids. As most of you guys will know, you'll notice this bottle. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to talk about this is because us doctors, we love steroids. You know, they make people feel better. Um, when people come to us with horrible symptoms, we start them on the steroids and they're dancing along the street. Um, the problem that we run into is that while they're great, they're also horrible. Um, and we spend a lot of time counseling about the benefits but also the risks of steroids. When people kind of first hear about steroids, they expect to, well, the reason we like them um, is because steroids improve people's symptoms. When we think about brain cancer, we obviously think, well, look, cancer is destroying parts of the brain and causing horrible symptoms. But when people come to us in the kind of acute setting, it's actually not the cancer which is causing the majority of the problems, but the swelling around the cancer. The way I describe it is it's a bit like a bee sting that you get this big red welt underneath your skin and that's what's happening in your brain. And the problem, the skin is stretchable, so you get the welt that goes out. Whereas in the brain, when you've got a skull, it goes inwards and that pressure causes this, a lot of the symptoms. Steroids are really effective. Ooh, I'll get rid of this, we don't want to that. Uh, really effective at managing these, the, the, these, this swelling. And that's why people feel better on it and their symptoms improve and uh, their weakness can improve and the general energy levels improve. Um, this here is a, just an MRI. I mean, this shows the cancer, but all this is probably all swelling. And you can see that a lot of cancer is large, probably about, it's twice as much, the size is twice as big because of the swelling as opposed to anything else. Now, when people start steroids, they expect to look like this. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case, as many people will know. I mean, why don't we like them long term? I mean, I suppose us doctors, we kind of think of it as various problems, body changes. You do not end up looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, this can be mainly um, cosmetic, um, but it has a big impact on people. Um, other more kind of pertinent problems are thin skin, which is prone to easy bruising and tearing. And you get people who are already liable for falls with really thin skin and on chemotherapy, which affects their blood clotting, and they fall, and they end up with these horrendous tears. Um, because of the steroids, you actually have increased risk of infections and of diabetes. Um, so the longer people are on them, the worse the problems. I mean, getting back to the body changes, we doctors are horrible. And back in the 30s, they actually used to describe this condition with excess steroids. And they used lovely things like lemon on a stick, which means that you actually get fat around your tummy, but really skinny legs. Um, moon face, where your face actually goes rounder, and it's pretty obvious to most clinicians who, which patients are on long-term steroids. And buffalo hump, so you don't end up looking like Arnie, you end up looking very different. Um, and that causes a big issue. The biggest issue that I have when I'm counseling my patients about the steroids is the last one, the weak legs. So everyone thinks that, you know, with steroids you get stronger. The problem is, is with these sort of steroids, it's particularly, it's particularly bad for the legs involved in the, top, in the top of your legs. So getting up and out of chairs, up and off out of toilets, can be really, really difficult. 
And it get, that, those muscles get weaker and weaker and weaker the longer you're on them. And they can affect how you walk. Um, so ideally we want people, the reason I try and get people off the steroids is exactly because of the last one. All right? And it's something to be mindful. I always try and tell people, do some exercises. That's not going to resolve the problem, but it helps to slow it down. Um, but you have to be safe. Um, the fundamentals of steroids, really, when I'm talking to my patients. If the symptoms are getting worse from the cancer, try the steroids. You give, a, give, give yourself a big blast for four or five days. If you feel better, well, then the swelling is improving and the steroids are working. Um, but if it's not working, stop them because they're not going to help you and going to cause you problems. If they are working, try and get down off the dose. Slowly drop it down. One of the other problems with steroids is that people are on a high when they're on them, and then you stop them, and they just crash. So wean them down, drop down the dose. Um, and we want to try and find the low, lowest possible dose. The best dose is none. Um, we don't always get there. Some people we do. Some people are steroid dependent, and it is what it is. And we kind of try and just find the lowest possible dose, like 2.5 or 2.75 milligrams. I mean, we start breaking up tablets all kinds of places, but we try and get to that lowest possible dose. Um, that's a quick little brief of steroids, nice and quick. Chemotherapy, this is why people come to see me. And again, I'm keeping this very general. I'm not a car salesman, all right? I don't try and sell off my chemotherapy. Don't get me wrong, I love it. it, like it I think it does something. Um, but at the end of the day, I am here to help the patients. And at the end of the day, it's the patient's decision as, a, as to how we treat them. Um, you will always be the boss, all right? A doctor should never tell you, you need to do this. A doctor said, you can do this, but there's other options. All right, bear that in mind. Why do we like chemotherapy? Because we've done studies. And the studies suggest that people on chemotherapy or certain chemotherapy in certain situations, they're more likely to live longer. And as part of that, not only is the chemotherapy likely to let them live longer, it delays the progression of the cancer. So it can keep them better for longer. Um, and in a small proportion of patients, especially with GBM, it's a really small proportion, we actually shrink the cancer and improve symptoms. But that's relatively rare, unfortunately, with this type of cancer. It is a poison, all right? We poison the cancer, but we also poison the people. And unfortunately, we don't know what sort of side effects people are going to get until we give them. We're working on that. One of the, one of the projects that Mark Hughes is actually funding is looking at trying to predict one of the horrible side effects of timazolamide, which is low platelets, um, where we're trying to actually figure out what patients should we avoid that chemotherapy into due to the risks from, that, from, that, from the, the treatment. But these are the things that we as oncologists, as we as medical oncologists, actually think every time we're seeing a person. And we have to balance toxicity and the side effects of the treatment versus efficacy and the effect the, can the chemotherapy has on the cancer. Now, the problems are that, you know, if someone's not well when they turn up to us, we are not going to make them better. And that's a fact, all right? If someone is really, really unwell, we will only make them worse. So people have to have a reserve, the patients have to have a reserve to be able to tolerate what we're going to put them through. And the last thing we want to do is make people worse off and, you know, affect them even more than they've already been affected. The other problem is that we can't predict the toxicity. And about 10 to 20% of people would develop side effects that are so severe that they need to actually come into hospital. Well, that's the last place people want to be already, again. Um, some of these side effects will be life-threatening and potentially fatal. Um, again, impossible to predict. Most of the side effects do tend to settle, and we can support people through them. With regards to efficacy, again, we're trying to get better at how we pick these, these, these the treatments, and we are getting there. Um, but in some people, despite the chemotherapy suggesting it'll work, it doesn't work. The cancer is resistant, and that's from the very beginning. And the problem that we all face, and is the most difficult probably, is the fact that even if the chemotherapy works for a period of time, it doesn't work forever, and eventually the cancer finds a way around. And that's when we start thinking of other treatments and other ways of using these drugs. So we as oncologists try and individualize our treatment. And what do I mean by that? 
It's my job and what I tell people is my job is to try and keep people as well as possible for as long as possible. When I walk, walk a tightrope, I sit there and I have to try and think of the physical effects my treatment has. And sometimes I have to tell people that actually I shouldn't be treating you because I'm going to make you worse. Um, I also have to balance the psychological impact of this disease. Hope is important, but I also have to tinge that with realism. And everyone's different. Some doctors are better at this than others. I don't say I'm good at it. I'm always trying to get better. What's coming? This is what people want to know. Now, I'm doing this generally. I'm not doing the specifics, all right? Things change all the time. What I am going to do is put up some websites which people can actually look at to see what's going on in research. Things happen slowly in anti-cancer treatment, all right? Very few drugs that look exciting in a Petri dish actually ever make it to us being able to give it effectively in patients. And it takes a long time because we have to do robust studies that say actually these drugs are doing someone a service, not a disservice. Those take, those take time and a lot of money. This is a, just something I stole off the, web, uh, off the web, which demonstrates how difficult it is to actually get a drug through all the processes to actually find that this is an effective drug and we can use it on people. Um, the far left-hand side is all the preclinical stuff done on the bench, and the middle side is the trials looking at in, in patients, you know, the clinical trials, and the right side is actually getting it from the trials into the patient on a population level. This is an American website. Instead of FDA, just change that with TGA, all right? So the TGA is the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this actually demonstrates that, you know, out of all those drugs that look great, very few of them actually get to the final stage. And what we suggest is that the drop-off, you know, about 70% 70 drug, 70 of drugs that make you do this and are found to be safe will go on to second set phase, which I'll talk about in a second. About 30 of these drugs, 30% of these drugs go into the third phase, and about 5%, 2 to 5% of the entire population will actually find that the drug is effective. So what are these trials? And it's important that you guys actually understand what trials are. Trials are investigations as to whether these drugs are worthwhile in populations. The, we divide the trials into different phases, phase one, two, and three. Phase one is the very beginning of a drug. You know, it looks good on a bent, on, on a, on a, in a Petri dish, but we want to try it in people. The main purpose of this trial is seeing if a drug is safe. They don't care about whether it affects your cancer. If it affects your cancer, it's a bonus. But this trial is all about trying to find out, is the drug safe? And what they do is they basically start off at a low dose of the drug and give that to a few people. If they're well, they get more, a few more people, go to the next dose and the next dose and the next dose. And what they're trying to look for is what is the dose which really knocks people around? Like what is the dose which actually really causes significant side effects? This is the guinea pig trial when patients come to me and they say, well, am I just going to be a guinea pig? Yes, you will be a guinea pig in this sort of trial. That being said, every single drug that we use today has been through this. And we never know what the next drug off the rank, if that's going to be the next kind of magic bullet. So these, these trials are important, but people have to go into them with the eyes wide open. They usually involve a lot of tests, a lot of blood tests, a lot of scans. They're very intensive which is obviously very difficult considering the cancer as well. Phase two trials, what they do is they take the, the dose that they found in the phase one. So basically in the phase one, they go up. Oops, that's too high. They go back down. And then they use that dose in the phase two trials. And they say, well, look, if, let's use it at that dose in a lot more people and see if it's really safe. And then they start saying, well, look, is this going to do something? And they start looking for a signal. Is the cancer shrinking? Are people living longer? Phase two trials usually involve you kind of de definitely getting the drug. Sometimes it involves a randomization or a placebo where basically half of the patients will not get the drug and get a, get a um, sugar tablet or something like that. If phase two looks good, then they go into the phase three, which are the large trials, which in enroll hundreds of people where they actually look, yes, this drug does do something in this cancer. Now, 
Phase three, great, you've done it, it's taken five years to get to that point. Then you end up with the issue of actually getting the drug onto the market and getting the drug available to people. The first step is actually a drug company applying to the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which is a governing body within the, the government which, which says these drugs have been proven to be safe and effective in Australian patients. We can actually approve these. It is safe. It's a very important process and a very important step and it regulates the safety within uh, the Australian population because they don't want drugs that are ineffective or dangerous being given to people. After the TGA, a drug is available for a price in Australia. Right? You, can pay, you can pay for these drugs. But a lot of these drugs are very expensive. And that's when the PBS comes in. The drug companies will then actually apply to the PBS to say, well, look, our drug is both is effective. It makes people live longer. It makes people live better. We think the government should help pay for these. Um, and that's where the PBS comes in. There's a lag time towards when drugs are shown to be effective till they actually become available to the vast majority of people. Once the, drugs effect, once the drug is TGA listed, on average, anti-cancer drugs, they cost several thousand dollars a month. The PBS will subsidize the effective drugs, but that takes time. That is the process for getting a drug into the population. Now, clinical trials, we can't stress this enough. In, in the oncology terms, clinical trials are the standard of care. And what that means is that if a clinical trial is available, we should be offering it to people. Um, because we always hope that things will be better. But the purpose about clinical trials is not look, also only looking at is it effective, but is this new drug actually potentially going to make people worse off? I'm not sure if anyone's actually searched for clinical trials. There's a few websites out there. They are horrible to look through. They are really difficult to nail down into one, is it appropriate for me and my patients? And kind of the lingo, the jargon, it's all very difficult. The top website, clinicaltrials.gov, that's an international website based out of the US. That's got most international trials listed on it. All right. Um, Basically, it allows you to search, and basically you put in glioblastoma, glioma, and then search through the trials. A lot of the trials will be irrelevant, because they'll be imaging studies or other things. There will be therapeutic trials. It takes a little sifting to get through that. Um, a lot of those trials will not be available in Australia. All right. The second website, those are the trials that are available through Australia. Now that website is very much in, modeled on clinicaltrials.gov and remains very difficult to search through. Um, another website, which is also local, um, looks at, it makes it slightly easier to search through. So clintrial.org.au. And in all honesty, what I recommend now, now that everyone's got smartphones, is look at apps. All right, these are the three main clinical trial apps in, in, in covering Victoria on the left, New South Wales in the middle, um, and Queensland in the right. Now, in this section where it says term computer screen, you can click on that. It'll give you all the clinical trials, but there's a subheading called neurological. You click on that, and you can search, and it'll tell you all the trials that are happening in the state at that point that involve. So if you go to your app store, uh, just type in ClinTrial Refer. I have to be in the interest of disclosure. Uh, I'm in charge of that, um, but I don't make any money out of it. Um, I just think it's a useful resource for, for clinicians and patients. Um, but I think it's also, uh, it tells you where the trials are happening in Sydney, in Newcastle, in Port. Um, so, and it's easier to fo follow than some of the other websites. So that'll just tell you what's available locally. Now, Therapeutic drug trials. I was given the remit to talk about what's coming. There's a lot coming. I don't know what's happening. What, what's going to be available soon, but there's a lot coming. And we're thinking of attacking the cancer in multiple different ways. We've been kind of concentrating on chemotherapy now for a good last 20 years. And out of all those trials and all those drugs and everything that we've done, 
we found one drug that works in glioma, and that's, that's timazolamide. Um, there's another combination which is ancient, which does seem to work in, in, in the lower grade gliomas. But now we're starting to look into all these other things. Um, Avastin, which is Pepsizumab, um, this was in the press uh, a few years ago in the treatment of brain cancer that affects the blood vessels around the cancer. It has no effect on the cancer itself, but it can actually uh, improve people's well-being um, and prevent them from needing steroids. Now, the government didn't think that was worthwhile paying for on the PBS, but it is TGA listed. Um, usually out-of-pocket expenses for a drug that doesn't actually make you live longer but makes you live better is in the order of about 20 grand. All right. There are other drugs that are looking at that in trials at the moment. Targeted therapy, we've got a trial at the moment in, uh, in looking at first-line glioblastomas, so GBMs, uh, in people who've just been diagnosed, trying to target their cancer specifically and target a special um, protein on the end of the cancer. The way I kind of describe it to people is that um, if you think of your house and you think of your antenna on the top of the house, the antenna, instead of thinking of one antenna and lots of signals, think of lots of signals to one antenna, so to lots of antennas. So each ante our cancer cells have millions of antennae on them, each picking up a specific signal. Now we found that in GBMs, there, there's a proportion of them, up to 30 to 40 percent, which have a very, very specific signal, which isn't very present elsewhere in the body. And so what we've done is we've taken a, something that will attach to that specific signal, take, which is an antibody, attached a really, really potent chemotherapy drug to that antibody, and then inject it into people. It's like a heat-seeking missile going straight at the cancer. Now these are the sort of trials that we're running at the moment. That trial's running in, in newly diagnosed glioblastoma. We had the trial open to people who had progressed after their initial chemo radiotherapy. That trial's closed. We're waiting for those results. Um, the biggest hope recently is in immune therapy, looking at are these new immune drugs going to be effective as they are? People would have seen it in melanoma and lung cancer. It's all through the press about the miracle drugs that make the cancers disappear. The real challenge with brain tumors is that our brains are specifically designed to prevent insults. And we're finding that these immune drugs don't seem to be as effective in brain tumors at the moment. Those are the couple trials opening. The problem is, is that when we think about changing people's immune systems, we look at it in two ways. We either take our foot off the brake, and what I mean by that is our immune system is in a fine balance. It's designed to attack cancer and immune cells, but it's also designed not to attack our body. And when that balance is shifted, we sometimes end up in a situation where people's own immune system will attack their body, um, causing quite bad side effects. So sometimes we've, what we've been doing recently and what the mo a lot of the trials at the moment are looking at is taking the break off the immune system to see if we can get it to attack the immune cells. That doesn't seem to work so well in GBM, what they're now looking at is how do we boost, how do we put the accelerator on specifically to the cancer? And there's some intriguing things going on. There's a recent glow-grade study looking at something, a vaccine, um, which is, which is uh, closed, and we'll see if that shows anything. What I would suggest, look at the apps, look, at, look for the trials. Always feel free to kind of reach out to the people and ask them if, they, if you'd be eligible. The thing about trials is they don't take everybody. There's specific kind of criteria which you have to meet to actually get into them. Um, do we see anything that's going to get onto the PBS anytime soon? No, we don't. Um, it's going to be a while before things happen, I'm afraid. But we're always looking. And I would say that because of, because of pressure put by patients and groups, there's a lot more impetus to actually do trials in this cancer. Five years ago, there was nothing happening. There's a lot more happening now, all right? I would also point out that a lot of the phase one trials, even two years ago, anyone with a brain tumor would be ineligible for because they would specifically exclude people who had brain tumors. Whereas now, because of this pressure, a lot of the phase one trials are allowing brain tumor patients in. So that's a big shift and it's a big thing. 
and it's allowing us to try and get people into these early phase trials. Uh, thank you for being here. <laughs>